Okay, I think I'm just about ready to get going here. I'm kind of a minute early, so just before I start, how many people already know who Tumum is? I've got maybe about half of you in Okay, so um, this morning, basically, I'm going to talk to you about creating animation for games, specifically related to 2D animation, because we at Tumum here uh, make the software that our customers use to produce 2D animation. So before I get started, who am I though? I am the product manager at Tumboom. So what that means is that I spend my time talking to the clients who are already using our software, and I find out what kind of features and, and stuff that they need in the software to make it better for their workflow and for the types of productions that they're doing. And then I work with our R&D team, and we have our CTO here in the audience today um, to um, sort of you know work with them to actually create the software that use, gets used. So. Um, I'm kind of the glue between the customers and the R&D department. Um, and I've been doing this now for four years, um, but before that I started out in um, a kind of a dual background. I have a background in engineering. I started out as a mechanical engineer, and then I um, decided that wasn't what I wanted to do forever, so I went back to school and studied art. So um, I kind of have like both sides. Um, and I love working in this field because you have the opportunity to kind of mix together the creative and the technological. So it's a very exciting uh, industry and field to be in. And yeah, so let's take a look here at who a few of our customers are. So you probably will recognize some names on the board here. Um, our TV and film industries are the primary industries that we work in at Action Boom. So for TV, people like Warner Brothers, Fox, Cartoon Network. If you've ever seen shows like Simpsons, SpongeBob, Family Guy, those shows are all made with our technology. Um, and then in terms of film, they had a wonderful film that came out this year called Le Congre, which is uh, going up for all kinds of uh, awards. If you saw Chico and Rita, if you saw any of the Disney films like uh, Princess and the Frog, these were all made with our technology. Now, recently, um, there's been a huge push towards creating a lot of games in 2D. So I'm sure you guys know this already, being that you're in this presentation. But basically, 2D has had a major resurgence because of mobile. And um, you know, there it's not just mobile. We do all kinds of different games, um, but mobile applications have really kind of brought it back to 2D because there are certain things that make it interesting for the look and feel, as well as for things like size limitations and efficiencies on playing back in game engines. So we've been working with a lot of um, companies now that are trying to integrate 2D animation into their games, um, like Disney Interactive being one of our major sort of partners at the moment. Um, so Disney Interactive is an example of a kind of a big studio production that is incorporating games in their pipeline. But we also support a lot of these micro studios and indie gamers. So you know there are a ton of people that are using our technology that we don't even know about because there's one or two people who, like an artist and a game uh, programmer, who are working together to create games that they don't even tell us. So um, I randomly went to um, what was the name of the show that I went to in Germany. FMX. So I randomly went to FMX last year, or the year before, now I can't remember. And I met, I went into a presentation and saw them presenting this game, which I'm going to show you guys, called The Inner World, which at that time was just in the early stages of production. And I was sitting in the audience next to one of my coworkers and I said, I bet you they're using Tumu. And um, she was like, well, should we ask them if they're using Tumu? I'm like, but what if they're not? I don't want to say that. So we didn't ask at the time. Then we went up afterwards, and sure enough, they were using Tumu to create their games. So I was like, well, we should talk to these people. So little people all over the place are using our technology, but now having that relationship and that interaction between our customers allows us to make um, a, a real pipeline that is geared towards gaming and better for game artists as well as the game programmers. So that's very exciting. So when we look at challenges faced by game creators today, this is basically the, the why slide. So why do people choose to use Tumboo? Um, the first thing that is really important, especially when we're talking about mobile devices, is the size limitations. So our customers want to be able to keep the size of the game under 50 megabytes so that you don't have to be on Wi-Fi to download it. And so um, being able to keep the size under 50 megs means that you have to have a very efficient sprite sheet. So um, in order to reuse or maximize the texture space on your sprite sheet, you can create cutout characters that are basically puppets that you would pieces around on, and then you can put that puppet on the sprite sheet, and it's a much more efficient use of your texture space. And I'll show you what that means um, in a few minutes. 
Also, other things that allow you to create a very efficient game are things like being able to extract the hierarchy information and being able to extract the animation data. Um, things like animation data, it's just numbers. Numbers is like practically for free, right? That's not, it doesn't take a lot of data transfer to, to throw some numbers around. So being able to just extract the original animation data and the hierarchy lets you recreate the animation the game engine on the fly in an efficient way. So um, when you look at our competitors, people like Flash. Flash doesn't allow you to extract a hierarchy data because it doesn't really have a hierarchy. It has this concept of symbols and nested symbols, but if you want to kind of create that real hierarchy with a parent-child relationship, um, I've seen some of our customers try to work around it by using certain tools like their phone tool, but it doesn't really get you there and it's not a very friendly animation experience. So it's not friendly from the animator side and it's not friendly from the game designer side. So uh, being able to actually extract the hierarchy information is very important for creating a game. And then, of course, the thing that really drives our customers is the fact that it's a friendly animation tool. So, you know, I've, we've been working with people that have been working with uh, game and TV for so long that we actually create our tool as an animator's tool. It, we, we get the feedback from the animators and it really is an animation tool. So it's much more friendly to the animator when they're trying to do animation. Um, this allows them to create animation quickly and effectively at a high quality and being able to do what they want to do. It also allows them to reuse artwork that they've done before, um, which I'll show you guys a little bit about. And then we also, right now, we're putting a big push into the ease of transition from the animation tool to the game engine. So we're doing a lot of de development at Toon Boom to, to ease that transition. And we've done a lot already that allows you to check your work without having to go to the programmer and say, hey, can you put this in the game so that I can make sure that it looks okay. So we've done a lot in that area already, and we're continuing to evolve um, on that pipeline. And what I'll do now is show you a few examples of some games that have been done with our technology so you can get a sense. So this first one is from Disney Interactive. Where's my Mickey? <laughs> This is the one that I met uh, by chance in Germany. So this is another example of someone that is doing um, animation using a cutout character and extracting the game data. What else can be said about the adventure genre the famous game designer Friedrich Nietzsche hasn't mentioned already? Now, nevertheless, I'd like to introduce you to the inner world. Join Robert, the extremely cuddly main character, and set out on an epic journey exploring a world which could be more round. But who is Robert? Where will Robert go? And why in the world, Robert? You'll meet folks who not only are able to talk, they even have facial expressions. Adventure experts among you may have already guessed the Lone Shamir is made an excellent, hand-drawn, non-stereoscopic 2D. The game length is about six to eight hours. With a probability of respiration of 60%, and for really untalented players, there's an extensive help system, firing more game hits at you than the number of Let's Play videos you can find on the net. For a little bit. A wrongly pronounced expression in our modern world is one of the most effective instruments of the adventure genre. Adventures offer the great possibility to deal with topics like dictatorship, theft, or murder in a refreshingly unbiased way. Just try it out yourself. All right. In short, I highly recommend buying this great game. Now, before I do. So that's definitely an exciting example. 
Um, this next example that I'm going to show you is still in progress, but I thought it would be kind of an interesting one to show you because I ran into these people when I was at Seagraph this year. And what they're doing is they're making a game that's totally hand-drawn 2D animation. So they're not using that cutout character way. They're actually redrawing every frame and they're extracting out. And these guys are making their game for PC, Xbox, and all these big platforms. So, so to them, having that small file size is not as critical. So they're really more concerned about the look and feel of the game. So I'll just show you a couple of seconds of this uh, little clip here. genre of our youth, if you're as old as I am, um, that you know kind of brings back a smile and uh, is, is very exciting to see. And I'm going to show you this example of what a sprite sheet looks like for a game like this so you can see the difference and really understand. Um, this one that I'm going to show you now is just another example of a hand-drawn example. So this game uh, was a game for the Facebook, uh, the Facebook for Facebook. Um, and uh, these guys were working out of San Francisco. Unfortunately, the game didn't do that well, uh, but the art was fantastic. So I want to show you what it looked like. <laughs> exactly what you do in the software. And so you're just taking the individual frames and then export those out as a frame-by-frame -frame sequence, which then becomes a sprite sheet. So this is the way to do it when you want to have a really uh, high-level control over what the game looks like, but you're not as concerned about um, file size and, and efficiency. So this is what they did with the idol worship example. I'm just going to kind of show you an example of what a sprite sheet would look like for something like the, the Sphere game. So, um, if you look at what the idle sequence looks like over on the right hand side, that would export literally each frame. So you can see that this takes up a lot of texture space, right? Like it's not a necessarily very efficient way of, of working. So then, now the other way of doing it is to actually just extract out the individual pieces of the character. So you can actually just say, hey, I'll take out the head, the hands, all of the body parts, and then when the animator is animating, they try to animate by moving, squashing and stretching things as much as possible, and then they have to do some new drawings sometimes, but each new drawing will show up as another drawing on your sprite sheet, so it takes up more texture space. So being able to animate this way really saves you a lot of, um, a lot of efficiency, but um, does kind of limit a little bit what the animation looks like. So what we'll do now is kind of give you a little tour of what the software looks like. And I'm going to start from just a kind of a high level perspective of what a cutout character is and how you can animate with it. Um, you can also do that very traditional 2D animation, um, 2D hand drawn animation where you're doing a new one every frame like they do in Beast Fury. So you can do any style of animation that you want in Toon. It's really kind of the sky's the limit. Um, but I'm going to show you this cutout example here. Um, this character is an example of a type of character that you would see um, more like on a TV show. She comes from a show called Stella and Sam. 
Um, and so I've, I've kind of changed the colors on her, um, but she's the same basic character. So what happens with a cutout character is that you have all of these different body parts, and they're all split up into their own layers. So what the animator can do is the animator can select the arm, and they can rotate the arm, then they can select the hand, and they can rotate the hand. So the first element that I was telling you about earlier was the hierarchy, right? So what that means is I actually have the ability to go in the software here and define a parent-child relationship. And when you see what this looks like, then it actually looks a lot more like what you would see in a software like Maya, where you actually see the parent-child relationships indented. So the lower arm here um, is a child of the upper arm. Um, let's go and grab the one that I can actually see here. Okay, so here I have the hand. The hand is a child of the arm, and the arm is a child of the sleeve. And so when I select the sleeve, I can move all of those elements together and all the children will inherit whatever animation data I have on the parents. And then I can go into the hand and I can animate the hands separately. And hands are one of the drawings where you have to redraw a lot or you have a lot of different versions. So um, when you create a new drawing, it shows up right away in your library. And then you can swap that drawing in and reuse it. And then what happens is that um, when it comes to games, you really want to reuse as much as possible. So you can actually create different scene versions for the different types of animations that you need. So like when you have um, an idle and a jump and a run, you can, they, those can be different versions of the same character so that you don't have to um, export the data more than once. So looking at this character now, I see that I'm able to swap drawings in and I'm able to rotate the drawings around. Um, one of the other things that does become very important in 2D animation is the skewing and squashing and stretching, so being able to elongate and uh, squish the drawing. So all of this type of data exports very well to your game engine. Um, then when we start looking at a little bit more of what happens on a production rig or TV, they also will do things like they'll combine together certain effects. So if I go in here and select the facial features group, I can move over the facial features. And you see that we have an effect in here that allows us to cut off the facial features with the edge of the face. So when you start combining together certain effects like this, um, these sorts of effects won't necessarily always export out to your game engine. It depends on what your game engine supports. Does your game engine support masking? Can we extract that data? But you can always export it as a frame by frame sequence. So if you're, what you're trying to go for is that really high quality look, you can use as many effects as you want. You can use all the tools in two, maybe you can have textures and all this other crazy stuff. But if you're just trying to extract the raw animation data, you kind of have to think about, okay, well, what can my game engine actually support at the end of the day? So um, when you combine together that with also a tool called Deform, Deform has the same limitations as the cutting and masking does. So, you know, certain game engines, well, at the moment, I don't think any, uh, we have managed to get the, well, we haven't really tried to get the Deform to export out, but Deform allows you to actually bend or warp a drawing. So the thing that becomes a little bit intense with this for a game engine is how to render this on the fly, right? Because there's a lot of stuff happening when you're actually taking a drawing and kind of bending it and warping it around. So that, you know, we haven't yet been able to support directly within the game engine, but like I mentioned, you can always export it out as an image sequence, or you can also take a deform and you can bake it out back to a drawing again. So, you know, if you want to use deform to um, create three different drawings just by dragging that around, bake it out to a different drawing, then now you have that in your game engine. So there's definitely ways of taking all the tools in Tubeboom and utilizing those. And then if I go and look at um, what this character looks like on the torso, I do have the ability to go in here as well and kind of change the shape and be able to kind of bounce it up and down. And then if we look at it, like, this is just a really simple piece of animation on this character, but if we kind of take a look at what the animation looks like, um, I use this scene all the time, so we've got some extra stuff in here. Let's turn off the camera for a second, because that's getting in our way. Um, and we do actually have a real camera in Move, by the way, which is quite exciting. So if I take a look at this animation, I'm able to take her all the way from her front to a profile um, and back over to the other side again, all without having any new drawings. So if you think about that, when you can maximize the amount of um, animation you're able to do without using new drawings, that's all great. So um, that's definitely something that is a huge advantage of working with Tubu. 
Now, from an animator's perspective, it's easier for them to go in here and work because they don't have to worry about things like symbols. They can actually just like, let's say I've got the hand, I can go into the hand, I can say, oh, you know, I need a new drawing on this frame, so let's go and duplicate the drawing and make a change. So you know, I can go in here and just, I don't know, put a, let's put a glove on her. So she's got her beautiful glove on now. And uh, when I make that change, I see it happen in my library right away. And it looks like I had my uh, draw behind on or something, but in any case. So um, what is interesting about this is the ability also to extract separately the, um, the drawing information, the keyframe information. So if I take a look at my drawing here, um, I have that new drawing happening somewhere in the middle here, frame 30 something, 32, 33, and um, I don't have a new keyframe on that frame. So in software uh, like Flash, you sometimes have to have like a new drawing every time you have a new keyframe and vice versa, but we actually handle those separately. And that's much more efficient also, once again, when you come back to texture space and things like that, because I only need to switch the drawing when I actually need to switch it. And then on, the, on top of that, I've got the information about where the drawing is. So you separately control where the drawing is versus which drawing you're using, and all of that data is data that comes out. So let's take a look at a couple of uh, game examples now. So um, there is a fun little character here called Space Duck, and I have an iPad up here that has this little sample game on it. If you guys want to come up afterwards and play it or try it out or see what it looks like, then you're welcome to do that. So Space Duck here is, this is the idol for Space Duck, just a simple little character um, who's hanging out. Um, so, what's interesting about this character is he's a very simple um, cutout character with some uh, parent-child relationships. But you can see when I play it back that even without having those extra special effects in there, I still have a very nice looking, smooth looking animation. And I'm able to get a really nice look out of the character. And so, doing things like being able to take the different elements, skew them, squash and stretch them, and um, rotate them around gives you that fluid look in your animation. And then if I want to take a look at another version of this scene, so this same character will have a run cycle and a jump cycle. So here he is running. So um, using being able to use the same character over again means that I only have to extract out those drawings that changed. So the head is all the same. The arms are the same. The only drawings that are changing is there's a couple of new drawings in the legs. So, now, when I export this out, within TubeMove now, we have the ability to kind of take um, this character and actually export the data out. So, in TubeMove, we have several scripts that allow us to kind of extract these things out. There's one called Export to Sprite Sheet. And so what happens is that first you can kind of define where you want this guy to save. So, I can save this. I'm just using this game preview around right now to show it. but. You can save it in the export folder. Well, let's call this SD idle 3 because I think I have a few other versions of that. And then I can actually go there and um, export it out. And then I can go in and check out what it's going to look like. So, popped up my game preview in the back. So, when I use that export, it actually does two things. It exports all the animation data and the keyframe data. And then it actually opens up the game preview. In this case, it's all um, using Cocos. But uh, we are also working on integration with Unity now. So uh, we originally started with doing this for Disney's Wallaber engine. And now we're expanding that to do it with more and more game engines. So the interesting thing about TubeMove is that everything is kind of saved as an XML file. So you can take that XML file, you can parse the data, and put it into whatever game engine you want. But now here, so what I've got is I've got my game previewer showing, and it's um, showing me the animation playing back in the game. So it allows me to make sure that when I actually get this animation into the game, that it looks the same as it looked when I was looking at it in Tubo. And uh, so if I had any special effects that weren't rendering properly, or if I had some drawings that were in the wrong place, um, Tubo does also have a sense of uh, Z depth, or does have a real Z depth in it. You can have X, Y, and Z coordinates. So if your game engine supports Depth. You can also have objects at different depth in tune and export those out. So um, you just want to kind of make sure that they all play properly. And then I can go back also and check out all of the other animations that I have exported out previously. So I can check my idle animation, make sure that's still looking good. 
I can check uh, the dog animation, and he's the evil guy, then the space deck is going to come in and kind of like, you know, kill the evil underdog. Um, so if you want to check that out after, you can check it out right here. Um, and then just to show you some examples, like we have this character here from 16 that, um, you know, we just took a regular TV example and exported it out. So even a full production rig, as long as your full production rig is making use of um, none of those, or not too many of those special effects that I was talking about, the full production rigs will export out just as well. And since everything that we're doing in Toon Boom is vector based, you don't really have to worry about um, you know, artifacts and, and um, sizes. When you are exporting your sprite sheet, you can choose the size that you want to export it to. And so if you're doing a mobile application, you can have a smaller sprite sheet. If you're doing an iPad, it'll be bigger, and you know, so on and so forth. So um, it's definitely as a, as a pipeline and as a workflow, it's really heavily evolving now um, to create games for 2D. So let's take a look at some other examples in here. Let's take a look at our dog. There we go. So Hunter Dog is um, a pretty easy character as well. Um, but when we look at how the animation looks, it looks really nice. So um, when we uh, break him apart, he's just a few simple little drawings. I've got the front arm, I've got the back arm, I've got the eyes, I've got the torso, and I've got his legs moving around there. So the legs and things are just literally a frame-by-frame -frame sequence that are exported out. So let's take a look at what the data looks like when it exports out, um, for those of you who are interested in that. So let's go out here and grab dog. Or actually, I think I had decided earlier, I had marked these, I think I decided I want to show you Jenny first. So when you look at the actual sprite sheet that's exported out, you can see what I'm talking about, that it takes all the drives that you use in the scene and it combines those together and atlases them together into one sprite sheet. And uh, when you look at the original animation data, then um, it first exports all of the individual drawings out on their own, and then it takes those drawings, atlases them, combines them together so that you don't have to do any of that manually. And then separately from that, you get the animation data as an XML, you get the drawing data as an XML, and then you get the skeleton or hierarchy data as an XML. And then when you use the, the plugins that Tomb was already created to go into the specific game engines, then it actually takes all of those, uh, all of that data, and you just kind of have to define what you want to have happen. So the events that you want to have happen. So you know when you drag your finger, play the IO animation. When you hit, press the, the the shoot animation. All of that is just combined together. What we've exported out plus the little bit of programming that you're going to do in your game engine. So taking a look at another example in here, I think I wanted to show you what. Uh, dog look like. So dog, and you can see how it exported out all of those drawings that I was showing you in the library as I was swapping those drawings out. And uh, he's just got one torso in here and one arm. So um, what's interesting is when you look at the actual animation on him, it looks really fluid, right? Like it doesn't look like he's only got one body and one arm. Um, it looks really like, you know, there's a lot of motion happening. But the motion that's happening is coming from doing things like skewing, squashing, and stretching. And even just doing a little bit of that, you can get a really nice, sophisticated looking animation. Especially if your game is only going to be this small, you don't want to spend all this time doing really detailed animation as if it's only going to be that big. So um, it definitely depends on the kind of game that you're doing at the end. So I want to show you just a couple other things. Um, I want to take you back to the traditional process for a second, just to show you a bit, of, a bit more of what um, Chingu does on that side. For those of you who are interested in doing games more like Beast Theory, that is just a straight up frame by frame animation. Um, so um, generally, what we do here as a process, and actually, I think I'll do this in my other version of stage because uh, I haven't loaded the sample files into this one, so let me just pop that other guy open. And um, so what we do in terms of a frame-by-frame -frame process is it's pretty much the similar thing to what you would be doing if you're actually making a game or, um, or sorry, if you're making an actual uh, TV show. So let's do a new example here. So um, within Tomb, if you have the ability to draw digitally, you can see up here I'm actually just using a simple tablet. Uh, but if you are kind of working with a Cintiq. Nowadays, there's a lot of tablet PCs, so you can use a tablet PC. I just was talking to Francisco about getting a new machine, and we're all kind of looking at all the new tablet PCs to figure out which one is going to be the one that's, uh, that's the winner. So so far, I think the Vino Duo is like top of the list right now. One of our guys got that one recently. But um, 
So when you look at this as a kind of a frame-by-frame -frame sequence, you can draw totally digitally now, whether you're drawing on the screen directly or whether you're using a tablet like I am up here. Um, and so you can define first a rough animation sequence. Um, you can start it with a storyboard before that. Most games um, do start it with a storyboard uh, when they are doing um, more detailed st styles of animation. Um, and if you're just doing a simple kind of run, walk, idle, you don't necessarily need um, a storyboard. But if you're doing something like Beast Fury, then you do. Um, and then you can go in here and actually draw the drawings. And within Boom, we have some really interesting kind of styles of pencil and brush. So we have a pencil that's actually a thick and thick line, but you have the ability to kind of move the position of the line around after you draw it. And then you have the ability to separately control the uh, thickness information on that line. So when you have, want to have these kind of interesting styles, interesting looks on your character, you can do that using the pencil line. And separately from that, you also have the ability to go in here and define a texture. So this is kind of a fun thing. This is what they used on the Congress, the new film that came out. So they really wanted to have um, an interesting style of line, and they wanted to get that hand-drawn feeling with a vector line. So you can do that using the pencil texture, and then you can go in here, and you can still, after you've drawn it, go in there and move the line around, and the texture follows the movement of the line. So it is a very nice, beautiful-looking line. And then when you actually go in here and you try to fill this in, um, since the line is defined by the center line, it fills in right to the center of that. You don't get any of that, like when you're working in Photoshop, you get that kind of crunchy little line there, and you're not sure what to do with that. Like you don't get that using too much. So it fills right into the center of that line, so you get a really nice looking line. So coming back to our example here, you can choose to use the pencil or the brush, but at the end of the day, you've got your nice character in here. And at this point now, you want to go in and actually paint that character in. So when you're painting the character in, you have the ability to use several different paint buckets. You can repaint the lines that you have already. And you can go in there and paint the stuff that doesn't have any paint in it yet. Like I can just drag over the eyes. I can drag over the eye highlights. So what Paint Unpainted does is it says, paint anything that doesn't yet have a color in it. Um, what Flash does as a comparison is Flash does this, which is not terribly useful. So you just want to paint the areas you haven't yet painted, and then it allows you to just go boom, 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 and you've painted the whole thing in. You also have the ability here to define an invisible line that you just draw for the sake of having a boundary. So you can draw the invisible line, and then you can go in there, paint the tip, and then paint the skin, turn the invisible line off, and now you see that boundary. And that boundary is a boundary that you can move after you've painted as well, so you're totally free to do whatever you want there. Now if we look at the final example when we pull it in, um, then here I see the full animated version with all the color in it. And when I take a look at this guy, um, I actually do have the ability also to change the colors after I've drawn it. So, you know, I've, I've painted this entire character in. What if I go in afterwards and say, hey, I need that bow color to be a different color? Then I can select that bow color and I can actually adjust the color. And um, when I was at Seagraph this year, actually, forgive me a second, I'm going to take a sip. Hmm. So when I was at Seagraph this year, I had one um, game company um, that came up to me and was asking me if we had the ability to extract the color information out of the characters because they were doing some post-processing on the color in the game, and they dynamically wanted to adjust the colors um, depending on the environment that they were in and so on. So in the game, you can very easily just have a filter that adds an extra you know, subset on top of the colors you have. But being able to extract out the individual colors gives you the, the ability to do whatever you want with that. So um, having these tools directly in here is very exciting. And when you look at the entire sequence, I don't have to repaint anything because it's just kind of you know, defining what that color is. So when I you look at the colors in here, it says, Take the color pot that's called bows and assign this RGB value to it. But this RGB value is just kind of a temporary whatever. It's just like the thing that is permanent is the color called bows. So that color called bows is something that you can extract out and you can change dynamically on the fly later on. And then within Boom, we can also sort of put certain um, effects on it. So I can clone the palette, make a copy of the palette. And now with this copy of the palette, I can do a tint panel on this. So this tint panel is kind of what the guys want to do in their game engine directly, but they can um, select the colors. They can, let's say if they're in a nighttime scene, they can add some more blue. They can turn the value down, turn the saturation down, 
And then, um, now this is the same version of the character, but for a different environment. So, you know, it's all very exciting to be able to, mm -hmm. to kind of uh, bring that together. So that kind of wraps up what I wanted to show you guys today. Um, I just wanted to go over kind of the animation for the 2D games. So you saw how to do some 2D character animation as a cutout character. You saw a little bit how you can do some hand-drawn animation and some of the effects that you can use within Tune. You also saw how to extract out the game information into a sprite sheet and preview it within the game previewer. Um, and then from that point on, it's up to whoever's programming the game to do what they want with the awesome animation that you've done. <coughs> so, does anyone have any questions for me? <coughs> oh, yes. Uh, the, this new technology with the pencil, so where you can apply texture and ch changing along the way, uh, I've heard it was only on Anime Pro. Uh, is it available for Harmony? It is in Harmony. If you think of it, um, so her question was, is the pencil texture available in Harmony? So everything that I've showed you today so far is Harmony. Um, we do have some other products called Animate and Animate Pro. So Animate is the um, sort of frame-by-frame -frame animation solution. So if you're just doing uh, this style here, where you're actually redrawing every frame, Animate is okay for that. Animate Pro allows you to do some cutout characters and, and do some of those effects. Harmony is the only one so far that we have done the game engine pipeline with. So Harmony is the one that we've actually extracted the sprite sheet data. It's the one that has the plugin architecture that allows you to extract all that stuff out. So when it comes to actually doing stuff for games, Harmony is definitely the way to go. It's not that you can't use Animate and Animate Pro, you can, but you have to go through more of a manual process of how to actually process the images that you get out at the end of the day. So um, definitely everything that's in Animate and Animate Pro is in Harmony and more. So Harmony is the what we call the flagship software at the top. And also, when it comes back to using textured lines and things like that, um, you when you think about exporting the sprite sheet, the, the exporter sprite sheet is actually, at that point, uh, a PNG. So, um, or you know, it can be whatever exact file type you want, but we're using PNG at the moment. So it's a rasterized image, and this rasterized image does contain whatever texture you put in the original drawing. There are some game companies that want to keep it as vector, so if you want to keep it as vector, we do have the ability to export to PDF and SWF, um, but at the moment with the uh, sprite sheet architecture that we've been working with, it has been pretty much uh, PNG based, so you get to keep all the textures in your lines. Although if it's printed out that small, you might not see it, but we'll have to double check. <laughs> Any other questions for me? Yes. Does your tool, uh, can your tool import uh, flash files? It imports um, SWF files. So if you have uh, started some projects in Flash, you can import from Flash uh, via the SWF. Other questions? Yes. Oh, okay. Did you guys think that was interesting? Yes. yes. Was it fun? <laughs> Okay, so if you guys want to come up and ask me any other questions afterwards, or if you want to come and see the iPad and play with the little game that we made using SpaceX, you're welcome to do that. So, thank you very much.